Oh, happy Halloween, dear listener. Oh, yes, yes, you noticed Malachi and I finally have decided on our costumes. I'm Pennywise, and Malachi is wearing an adorable little yellow raincoat. And you, well, you dressed up as yourself. So, interesting choice. Meta. Anywho, welcome to my annual radio rental Halloween party. Seems like you're a little bit early. Now, today I've got an extra special surprise for you. But I'm saving it until the end. In the meantime, I'm going to start bobbing for apples before that water gets gross, filled with mucus and saliva. Now, how about you enjoy our very first tape? I was the assistant manager of a video rental store. Pretty large store, had three departments. There was a book section, a video section, and then a music section. It looked like it was an old Kmart. And then they came in and turned it into a video store, music store, bookstore combination. And it was myself and another assistant manager. And then we had a staff of some high school kids. They had asked earlier in the night if they could leave early, of course, finish your duties, get on out of here, we've got this. You know, we were, we were good managers. One of the things that the store had was, you know, anytime there was a customer, you had to greet them. You know, you had to go out of your way and greet them. So you were always looking out as you did your regular duties to try to find a customer to help and see if there was something that you could help them find or direct them in a certain way. And it was just overall a really, really fun job to have at that time in my life. The night started pretty boring. Not a lot was going on. Uh, it was slow enough that when the kids that were also working that night wanted to leave early, it, w it wasn't an issue. So it was pretty quiet. The kids finished up and we let them leave about an hour before closing. So it was just the two of us there for the last hour manning the front and the back of the store. I didn't really have a whole lot to do except for to check in the movies that were dropped off, put them in alphabetical order before we closed up for the night. I was taking my stack of movies to the very far corner to go alphabetically and put up what was in my hands and come back to the front. And I got to the very far corner and I put up a few and I was kind of leaning over, putting up some videos on a bottom shelf. I heard someone sniff. <laughs> and I looked down and there was a man standing 10 feet down at the end of the aisle from me. He was just standing there with his hands clasped. First, he had like a closed mouth smile. Seemed very pleasant. His smile broadened to where I saw his teeth. Looking at him, he was unremarkable. There was nothing really about his facial features, nothing about him that stood out, except for he was very tall. I'm six feet tall, and he was taller than I am. so. I did know he was very tall and he was very thin. His hands were very old and very wrinkled, but his face, he looked in his 50s, maybe his 60s, but his hands were much older than his face. And he just stood there with his hands clasped in front of me. And I noticed his fingernails were really manicured and very shiny. The most peculiar thing about him is how he was dressed. From head to toe, he was in a red suit, fire truck red. His shoes were shiny red alligator. They matched his pants, same color of red as his button up shirt underneath. There was a vest and a jacket. The buttons were red. Every single thing that he was wearing from head to toe was fire truck red. Every single shade of red was identical. That's not easy to do if you're piecing together an outfit. It's really hard to match shades of red, but everything from his shiny shoes to his tie to the buttons on the cuffs of his coat, the exact same color of fire truck red. His suit was not in fashion at the time. His suit was more of a older style suit, more pointy lines with the cut of the pant. His alligator shoes, they had square toes, and those were not popular back in the early 2000s. Then his suit was more of a slimmer cut suit than what was popular at the time. 
But you know, he was an older guy, so I thought maybe he just pulled something out from the past that he's wanted to wear out tonight. I think that my initial reaction was just that he was an, another character that comes into the store, you know? You, you kind of notice the strangeness about it, and I took note of it and looked at him, and I realized this is, this is a, a strange getup that you have on, but you just continue on with your business. You see, in, in retail, you see a lot of different characters come in, and it was just, could have been anything. <laughs> I said, you know, hello, welcome to Hastings. Is there anything I can help you with? He never responded, so I kind of said, okay, well, I'll be right over here. Let me know if I can help you. And I continue restocking videos on that same shelf. A couple of other times, I did hear him sniff again. So I would look down and he was still standing in the same spot. One of the other things that made me kind of give him a little bit of privacy on the back row where we were standing, the main outside wall of the building was like new release videos, but behind us or behind me, the shelf was foreign films, audiobooks, and adult videos. I thought, okay, maybe he needs a little privacy picking out what he needs. Whatever, I will go around the corner to the other side and let him be because it, it was very awkward. When you speak to someone, they can tell you to piss off or they can tell you, you know, no, I don't need anything, thanks. It is kind of strange for someone to just stand there and to just stare at you and not interact with you. They just stand there. After he didn't respond, didn't seem like he needed any kind of assistance or help, I continued on finishing shelving the items on the aisle that he was on. I walked around probably two or three aisles up from where he was standing. I lost sight of him. The height of the aisle between him and I or the shelf was taller than he was. But where he was in the store, there was no way for him to come around me one side or the other without me seeing where he was. About that time, I'm finishing on a, on a different aisle and it was 10 minutes until close and the manager up at the front of the store gave his announcement. We're closing in 10 minutes, gather the remaining items that you might have and bring them to the front and thank you for shopping here. So by this time, I'm like, okay, it's time to go. Time to start wrapping things up. We typically would go to customers and just encourage them, anything else I can help you find, you know, we're about to close it down. I wanna get you checked out. I finished what I was doing, finished the videos that were in my hand, walked back around to where he was and turned the corner and there's no one there. I was very puzzled by that because he would have had to walk past on one side or another to get back to the front of the store or to get to another department and I didn't see him. I would have seen him and, and I didn't. It concerned me and I thought, well, Maybe he slipped past and I just, I just missed him. Before I went to the front, I circle around my department and he was not in the video section. Walked through the aisles and couldn't find him. So I went around to where the books were and walked through the entire book section and he wasn't there. So I went up to the front where the other manager was still standing behind the register, finishing out his closing duties up front. And I said, hey, Todd, what happened to the man that was here with us? And he said, well, what man, there, there's not a man here. And I said, no, there, there was a man in the red suit. He had on a red suit, red shoes, and he kind of looked at me like he was puzzled. He said, no one has even come in the store in about 45 minutes. And I said, mm, well, he was here then before. He's got to be here in the store. He, if he didn't walk past you to go out, he has to be in here. Did his final closing, um, no one came up front. So we immediately locked the front doors and start to do a walkthrough to try to make sure that he's not hiding somewhere. We did a walkthrough together and then we split up and we did another walkthrough separate and there was no one in the store. We went to the back storeroom where typically it stayed locked at night because a lot of trucks and shipping come in at night. So we kept the storeroom locked. There was no need to be back there. Unlocked it, did a thorough search, checked the doors. It wasn't in the back of the store either. This guy's in here and he's hiding. He's evading us. He's here somewhere. I saw him. I heard him. I heard him sniff. I could see the color of the buttons on his jacket sleeves. I know this. I didn't imagine this. It's natural that you start questioning yourself and your sanity a little bit. What's wrong with me? Am I, I might be having a break here. You know, what, what's going on? Did I imagine this guy? 
I remember every single detail about him down to his hair. I mean, he had typical preacher's hair, the way that it was slicked over and combed. Then I finally came to terms that something else has to be going on. I didn't imagine it, but it's obvious that he isn't here in the store. I don't think that he thought that I was crazy. I think that he wanted to just maybe prove to me that I didn't see what I thought that I saw, or we could maybe see if, if he was in the store, we could find out where he's hiding by looking at the security footage. So we go back to the back office, load up the computer with the security footage, and he knew how to rewind and use the system, so we rewound to the point to where we let the kids leave. An hour before closing, we watched the kids leave. We watched, you know, there were a few customers in the store at that time. But from the time that the kids left until the two or three customers that were in the store when they left, no one else came into the store at that time. So I said, okay, we'll fast forward to right after you did your closing announcement, you know, at 10 minutes till. So fast forward to that part. The area where we were in the back corner was a high shoplifting area, so there was a camera pointed directly at that area. For a 30-minute period after those kids left until we closed and went to watch the tape, the video was completely black for that one camera. That's exactly where he would have been standing. The video was normal, pointing to the aisle, and then it was like it just flipped and just flipped to the black screen for 30 minutes and then it flipped back. He would have been in the very center. If you could paint a bullseye on where the camera was pointing, it would have been pointing exactly where he was standing. 30 minute block of just a black screen with occasional interference going through the screen. It just flipped. He wasn't there. I believe in the world, personally, that there are a lot of things that happen and that go on that don't have an explanation. He was there. I am so sure that there was a man standing there. If I could draw a picture, and I'm not an artist at all, but if I could draw a picture, I could draw you a complete picture of his face, of his smile, the way his teeth were crooked. I think it's just the not knowing what I was looking at. I saw something, and I saw someone, but there's no proof that it was another human being standing there in that aisle next to me. I don't know if it was the devil. I don't know if it was a ghost, but I know that it was, it was someone or it was something that was there. It scared me to death. I'll never forget it. The devil's the great deceiver, so why not have him look pleasant with a pleasant smile. Go help him. We're back. Oh, freaky, no? Well, it's Halloween. What did you expect? Frankly, I know the culprit. A mysterious man in a red suit who has entered against someone's will and then strangely, almost supernaturally disappeared. Well, the answer is quite clear. Santa Claus. Red suit, check, creepy. Enters people's houses at night, circumventing security cameras. Deposits gifts for them. I never trust that. The perpetrator was most definitely Mr. Claus. Now it's time for the scariest part of all. Ads. And we're back. Next tape. This is my third attempt to 100 miler. I started running when I was 14. I am turning 35. And I've run dozens and hundreds of races, and I have never, ever DNF'd. Did not finish. Quit, basically. Like, gave up. I'm gonna finish this race, no matter what. Like, you'll have to yank me off of the course. I'm very competitive with everything. Booked my flight. My plan was to go alone. My boyfriend couldn't afford it. And last minute, my best friend was like, I'm gonna go. And I was like, okay, great. <laughs> and so we went. 
My best friend flew in the day before. The plan was for her to just help pace. She was actually really sick with a cold. It was in January of 2019. First time out of the continental states had just flown down to Hawaii, Oahu, and I was registered to run the Hurt 100 miler. It was this group of runners that were like, let's create a really hard 100 mile trail run on the island of Oahu. And so they created the Hurt 100 miler. Incredibly technical. You're talking like ankle breaking roots and you're sliding everywhere. It rains, like it's like downpours. It's just known for putting you through the ringer. I get there to my Airbnb, I scope out the course, I'm all set. The course is five laps of a 20 mile loop and you have to get it done within 36 hours. And so, yeah, I was already pretty darn nervous. So going into this race, I was kind of like, okay, it's gonna suck, but I'm gonna get it done. So we start the race, breathtaking. I mean, so pretty. At the beginning of the race, yeah, you're like still like, your nerves are all going crazy, but it was just fucking beautiful. I've never been anywhere tropical before. Sections of the trail where it was just lined by bamboo, one of the turns, you come around this really rocky section, but then there's the Manoa Falls. It's so pretty. Like, tourists, they come up, gets maybe a half a mile hike, mile hike in to see the falls, and it's just so pretty. But then, you know, that quickly fades when you're running and you're just like, shit, I have 80 more miles to go. You turn into a machine in a way where it's like you have to get this race done I went out a little too fast on the first lap. It starts to rain. I was pacing perfectly. And then I start to slow down like the third lap. By that point, it started to become dark and still raining. Like I was pretty locked in. By lap three, the rain had stopped. There's a full moon, absolutely beautiful. And I started to struggle a lot calculating in my head, when am I going to get to the next mile check-in? I need Cassie. If she has like the flu, she has a fever, I don't care, I need her for lap four. So I finally see her at the race hub. I was like, you gotta come with me, I'm dying out there. She's like, okay. So we start at the fourth lap, everything was fine, she was talking to me. It was maybe like, 3 a.m. at that point when she started with me. The sun started to rise and Cassie loves to take photos, tons of photos all the time. I'm ahead and she started to take photos of everything. Again, at that point, I had been alone on lap four, rarely bumped into any other runners. Lap four is with Cassie. So we're running along this one section and it was 8 a.m. ish. So she's taking photos and she's way behind me. All of a sudden we get down this hill and my right foot, the top of the foot starts to hurt like excruciating pain. It felt like somebody was like jamming a knife through the top of my foot. It was really sharp. Up to that point, I had no pain. I've never had that pain before. I wanted to just stop right there. And I start crying hysterically. Like I couldn't stop crying. I felt like I was just giving up and I never give up on anything. It felt kind of out of body or out of mind where it's just like, really? Like I'm gonna quit now? One more, one more. And I just remember telling Cassie, I was like, I don't have another one in me and just, you're done. There was a race I did before a 100 miler, and I was a 105 miler. And I remember just like limping in and I still got it done. Right after that foot pain, it was just like, done. 
I'm done. It wasn't because of the foot pain. Maybe this is my body saying, if you push it too much, something bad might happen. In my head, something clicked that was like, you're done. Don't go any further. You should not finish this race. You should just stop right here. We had maybe like four miles left of that lap. Cassie's like, oh, you can do it. You can finish. She tried to convince me to keep running, to complete the race. And I was like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I was so adamant about like, you are not going to finish this race. We get to the race hub and I sat down and I was like, nope. Didn't even have any second thoughts about like getting back out there. I sat down, I was crying and the race official came over and they're like, you needed to give us verbal consent basically to be like, you're done. You, you want to quit the race. And so I'm crying and I'm, I've said, yes, I'm done. And I can't do it. In my mind, something was a little weird, a little off. I just felt like if I kept on going, something really bad would have happened. Maybe this is my body's way of like, don't push it. Just don't push it. I just remember sitting in that chair, telling the race official that I was done. I was like, who is this? Why am I quitting? I know I have one lap left. It went away after I adjusted my shoe. But then the whole like quitting the race kind of overtook everything. And I've never DNF'd, like before then and even after. Nothing. They hose you off and I'm crying and there's a photo of me just bawling. And I call up my parents and I'm like, I'm a failure and I quit. I just felt like such a failure. And they're always like so supportive. They're just like, you're not a failure, you're fine. We go back to the Airbnb, relax, take a shower, you know, chill. Cassie starts sending photos to people back home of our race. She sent a ton of photos back to her mom because her mom knew that Cassie was going to Hawaii to watch me race. And Cassie's mom asked, who is that person covered in mud approaching Kay in this one photo? Hey, sorry for interrupting. My name's Mike, and I'm one of the producers that helps put this show together. And we feel like this story requires a bit of a visual aid. Kay, the storyteller, showed pain and I in person the picture that she's referencing and it blew our minds. I'm not really a ghost person. I'm way more of a skeptic, but we strongly advise you to pause the episode right now and check out our Instagram page at Radio Rental and see it for yourself. Don't worry, we'll wait. Or you can just pause the episode. That would work just as well. Okay, did you see it? Great. Back to the tape. So we saw it in the photo. We sent it to the, our friends in the group text, and we're like, what is this? Oh, shit, what is that? It's a horizontal photo, a live photo, and very tiny in the photo, basically right in my path but it's in front of me. It looks like this gray person, completely gray, wearing like a dark gray cloak. It looks like a statue. I was like, no, there weren't any statues along the trail. It's a live photo. And you press the, the photo and it's the creature starts to take a step up. It moved in the photo toward me. 
I did not see that. My boyfriend Googles Mud Ghost Hawaii, Night Marcher pops up. I'm alone in Hawaii, Cassie had left. I Google Night Marcher, it's not fun. You know, going down the rabbit hole with my friends through the group text and according to Google, they wander around the trails of Manoa Falls. It's a warrior that protected the islands from like centuries ago. And there's this one section where they have appeared. So Cassie, she pointed out on her map of like the timestamps, photos, and then the location of the photos. Basically everything was adding up to like, this is a night marcher. I didn't want to believe it, but I mean, what the heck else is this thing? The morning of seeing this thing, I had noticed that the moon was red. I Googled Hawaii moon and it said blood moon. Apparently night marchers appear whenever there's significant moon phases. According to Google, if you stare upon the eyes of a night marcher, you're dead. I thought I was cursed, like I had something like pop up in front of me and maybe that was the reason why I dropped out. Maybe that was why I, in my head, immediately thought like, you shouldn't go on with the race. I mean, it wasn't a good feeling. It was, I was very nervous and then I kept thinking like, shit, something bad is going to happen to me. Did somebody put a curse on me? So many things pop through your head when there's evidence of a ghost-like creature within a foot of you. My one friend, Jeremy, was like, this is viral. Like, this is a viral hit. You need to post it. I'm not one to post anything. I hate posting crap. I hate getting comments, just opinionated people. Drives me crazy. I was like, fuck it, I'll post it. And Cassie did too. And then one of our friends created a video where it captured like the actual movement within the live photo, just so show people like an easier way to see like the thing moves. Immediately we get like hundreds of comments and shares and within 24 hours, we get Hawaiians commenting. They're not happy at all because Hawaiians did not like us claiming that it was a night marcher. They ripped us to shreds. It was more us jumping to the conclusion like this is a night marcher. They believe in these things. They believe in these warriors that have protected their islands for centuries. It's kind of taken a jab at like their culture and beliefs and so they just took offense to it and they were like these Harleys don't know anything about Hawaiian culture and then there were a ton of Hawaiians that were like oh that's most definitely a crackhead or meth addict. I think I would know if I walked by like bumped shoulders with a meth addict during a hundred miler. It went from a simple very innocent question to the public and it turned quite violent in the comments. I mean, we were getting like harassed and people wanted us to die a violent death after seeing a night marcher. And so we took it down. I kept it up on Instagram because I have like no followers. Cassie has a bunch, so she took it down. We don't know what this is. I do plan on going back to run. Who knows if I'll see another night marcher. Oh, wow, what a story. Ooh, the scariest part of that story is the fact that anyone thinks they should run 100 miles in less than 36 hours. Oh, I can't stand runners. I mean, let's face it, folks. If women stopped running in forests, the entire true crime industry would be decimated. 
Anyway, here it is, the moment you've been waiting for, my surprise. Oh, 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 oh. you're gonna love this. I'm gonna, let me pop this tape in. Here, hold my balloon. Well, this event occurred in Riverside, California at the Riverside Comic-Con, where I was a featured speaker and doing signings of headshots. Oh, Comic-Con is a wonderland of greasy nerddom. It sounds like virginity and Star Trek impressions. It smells like B.O. and pretzels and old magazines and hot dog water. And it feels like back knee. Comic-Con is terrifying, believe you me. Incredible experience, I highly recommend it to anyone. My booth in the main hall was next to a, a young actor, well, not so young, can't really call him an actor, but a gentleman who goes by the name of Nathan Fillion. He's, I don't know how we'd describe him, as like a Canadian Matt Damon. He has a very square jaw. Apparently, he was the actor on um, a long-running show about solving crimes called Murder, he wrote. No, House, something like that. Anyway, um, in conversation with Mr. Fillion earlier in the day, he admitted to me something that I had never heard before in my life. He admitted to me that he was, in fact, an alien. alien. He was riding around in a human body. He was an alien zygote, currently inhabiting the body of Nathan Fillion. And he liked to do conventions because when he shook people's hands, he infected them with his spores. Well, I was, I was flummoxed. I was, I, I was overwhelmed. I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This was the first time I had been to a Comic-Cons. I was currently undergoing some financial difficulty and was hoping to make a little money on the side. So I was hoping that it would be, actually I was hoping it would, would have been a little more lucrative than it actually was. But, um, you know, we all do what we can. So there I was, side by side with alien Nathan Fillion. Well, here's the interesting story. <clears throat> I was parched during a panel discussion later that day, and he offered me his lemonade. The scariest part is when we were leaving, he did take my hand, he grasped my hand. I saw a horrific vision like none other I had ever seen before in my life. I was transported suddenly to his alien home planet, and I saw it all before me. There I was, on his home planet of animal snake juice. But, and you can, you can just beep that out. That's what the English translation of his home planet's name sounds like. It's disgusting, I know, but. The planet sounded like, oh, like a cacophony of screams, like a, like a, a bird trapped in a, in a bear trap, screaming its little lungs out everywhere, a cacophony of, of screaming, vomiting birds. And I could feel tentacles surrounding me in, in this, in this the most alien, horrific environment you, you've ever seen. I couldn't, I couldn't breathe because the, the, the atmosphere was, I was transported, I tell you. The, the atmosphere is filled with, with methane or God knows what. I couldn't breathe and there I was on this planet and I, I, I knew I had been taken there and boom, just as suddenly as I had arrived on that planet, I came back to my senses and found myself back in the parking lot outside of the Riverside Auditorium by my car, ready to go home, standing next to Nathan Fillion himself. Well, as we know, Terry Carnation tries to stay open to all possibilities, but uh, I'd certainly never had a personal experience with aliens. I'd heard countless stories in my days as a radio disc jockey late at night about aliens and UFOs and abductions, but this was my first personal experience. It's the truth, but then he revealed to me that he may have spiked the lemonade with LSD, so, did I actually go to his home planet of smeg juice, or was I simply hallucinating, courtesy 
of Mr. L, Mr. S, and Mr. D. I would absolutely consider what happened to me an abduction. And now I have a much deeper understanding, no pun intended, of alien abductions and alien probings. No probings for me, which is, which is really too bad. I, I, frankly, I'm open to it. I'm open to an alien probing, and if anyone happens to be listening, any of them happen to be listening, teleportation to an alien planet with a methane atmosphere is one thing, but I'm open to a little probing. So sue me. Well, here's the odd thing. He then reached into his pocket and handed me a wad of $20 bills, said, here's $15,000 from signings that I did today. I have no need for your human money. I was here to infect as many people as possible via the handshakes. The money is all yours. I made out like a bandit. Mr. Fillion, wherever you are, God bless you. And thank you for that... That sounds like a television show. Hello, J.J. Abrams, if you're listening. Oh, I told you it would be worth it, didn't I? Hmm? Best tape yet, yes? <laughs> what? No, I didn't make that myself and stick it up in that box. How dare you suggest that? It's all true. Well, despite you being a doubter... I hope you have a very happy Halloween. See you all next time. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Radio Rental is created by Payne Lindsay and brought to you by Tenderfoot TV. Executive producers, Payne Lindsay and Donald Albright. Hosted by Rain Wilson as his character, Terry Carnation. Produced by Payne Lindsay, Mike Rooney, and Meredith Stedman. With additional production by Eric Quintana. Written by Meredith Stedman. Additional writing by Mark Lachlan. Sound design by Cooper Skinner. Original score by Makeup and Vanity Set. Cover art by Trevor Eiler and Rob Sheridan. If you have a Radio Rental story that you'd like to share, please email us at yourscarystory at gmail.com or contact us via the form on our website, radiorentalusa.com. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Rental. You can also follow the illustrious Terry Carnation on social media. Just search at Terry Carnation. To hear more from Terry, listen to his podcast, Dark Air. Special thanks to Grace Royer and Oren Rosenbaum at UTA, The Nord Group, Station 16, Beck Media and Marketing, and the team at Cadence 13. On behalf of the Radio Rental Store, we'd love it if you'd subscribe, rate, and review. And don't forget to share our show with a friend of the genre. Thanks for listening.